going on, guys? Welcome back to Before the Whistle. I'm your host, Maddie Hudak, and I just wanted to take a second and thank everyone listening and watching for what was overwhelming feedback to a very unexpected and really fulfilling conversation with Ross Jackson, my guest on my last episode. And for the length that it was over an hour, as someone that personally can't really take more than 30 minutes of another podcast, feels a little hypocritical, but that conversation just didn't feel finished until that hour or 20 minutes was up. But, you know, I brought Ross on to talk mostly about the Saints OTAs and we really just got into life itself. I learned about myself. I learned about Ross. I learned how to take things that he said in that episode and uh, apply them to what I'm doing now on this podcast. But a, a few things really resonated with me and it seems like they resonated with you guys as well. And that's why that's so meaningful to me because that was really off the cuff. And it was really, again, a really vulnerable, emotional conversation that had no X's and O's talk whatsoever. I think we're both success stories at this point, which is something I'm working on saying. We discussed our imposter syndrome on taking untraditional pathways to get to where we are and how experiences you might not have realized at the time really can come in handy in a sport that I'm sorry, a sport, but an industry that I think people with a lot of flexibility and can look at things from different angles really thrive best in rather than being more rigid in both the way that you think and the way that you want to approach your coverage. Because if I just wanted to stick to writing, I I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be probably wearing this polo and I wouldn't have two rings to go along with it. And on that note, I want to explore a little more, you know, talking about those untraditional pathways how that led to actually becoming a sideline reporter because I had entered the industry about six months or so, I want to say prior to that, maybe like, you know, nine months, I guess, but how much that really changed my trajectory and what I really unexpectedly leaned into from an emotional standpoint. But the heart of what I really want to get to today is how I feel like sideline reporters are such a critical arm of the broadcast how that's so undervalued and what I think the most rewarding part of being a sideline reporter is. I don't know if y'all can notice, but, and if you watch the video version and are watching this video version of both last week and this current episode, you notice that I'm working very hard on keeping my shoulders back. And a lot of that had to do with our conversation and how Ross really explained this four-step pathway from conscious incompetence, which is when you don't really know that you're doing something considered incompetent, like something like bad posture. And I think you'll notice in today's format, sometimes I go into things and I really just start rambling and I lose track of time. Oftentimes that really leads to diamond in the rough coverage, but Sometimes it can lead to me going down rabbit holes and not really being aware of it because I have time blindness due to my ADHD. Speaking of which, I meant to set a timer for this. uh, And this is something I would highly recommend if you're again watching this on visual and have an issue with keeping track of time, literally get a physical timer. But the idea that you're unaware of something and then you become aware of it, but you haven't really done anything to fix it. And then you're almost hyper aware of it, which is that step three idea of conscious competence where You've really mastered, for example, putting my shoulders back and being able to speak with good posture, but I'm really aware of it. And the first couple episodes, I actually hid the camera view and just kind of focused on staring straight ahead, mostly because I didn't want to be, again, hyper aware of what I was doing. And with a couple episodes under my belt at this point, I feel like I'm over that, but it also, I think, is helpful as a barometer to see if I start becoming Quasimodo from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. But that was something that really resonated with me. And I think that when you come into a industry that you didn't go to school for, and you don't really have a protocol or a handbook for, oftentimes that's really the best position that you can be in. You know, I had said that I sometimes feel ridiculous when I get these DMs from people asking me for advice and that they look up to me. And talking about that imposter syndrome, at first that was really hard for me to reconcile because I just wasn't sure what everyone was seeing that I guess I wasn't, but as the years go on and I've really grown into this role that I had absolutely no experience in, and I say that for multiple aspects of my sports coverage, I've come to realize how each one of my experiences 
in the workplace really got me to where I am today. And also a lot of things from my childhood that I honestly didn't think I'd joke about as much as I do now. But brain blank. Those are something that I have often. Yep, I got my train of thought back because I wrote it down on a piece of paper in front of me. Again, I am really uh, putting those building blocks in. But as a lot of you know, I went to school for psychology. And I remember taking a sports psychology class and really enjoying that and realizing that this wasn't really a major that had a defined career path. But because you go to school for it, you think, okay, well, I need to go on and either you know obtain a PhD because you can't do anything with an undergrad psych degree or I need to go get my feet wet in the workplace. And so I did that. I worked in the behavioral health lab at the VA in Philadelphia for a year and a half where I did behavioral health intakes with veterans. And I was also a research coordinator and implemented uh, and orchestrated the implementation of two different studies in a six month period. So I, I've done intakes. I learned how to ask the right questions. And it's mostly when I was in that research coordinator format and even in the baseline format, you work at the VA, there's a very defined set of assessments, but a lot of veterans, especially, they're taught to put things inside them and ignore them and not talk about them. And so you really have to coax that out of people sometimes. So I found that that and just my empathy and understanding for others has continued to carry over. And then I went into jury consulting where, again, it's basically psychology of the law. You could have the best legal argument out there, but if you're speaking in legal jargon in the same way that some people can alienate with overly terminology, scouting terms, you know, three tech, four, all those things without really explaining what you're doing, your listeners aren't going to care. And that also applies when you're talking to a jury and especially when you're talking to a jury. So learning how to shape a message in a way that people will resonate and understand that. And honestly, what I took away from being a case analyst at a class action law firm was how to advocate for people. I've always been a natural advocate. And that was why I'd left jury consulting because I honestly just couldn't morally stomach doing any more defense cases. But I also felt like I was an advocate to a fall and I was going to run myself into the ground if I kept doing that as, as a primary job. And so again, I got laid off in the pandemic. I had started to write about sports and I realized that in every job that I was in, I was trying to find a way to write, be it research reports, writing up the protocols, writing up every single procedural guide before I left the VA, writing jury profile reports, which I was allowed to do on my own. And you know, I wrote a 40 page fact narrative document on a systemic juvenile detention system abuse case, looking at a lot of factors and reading through all of the interviews that built a psychological profile, to be honest with you. And I, I use that a lot of the time to advocate for at times, a, a class of 800 women, for example, in, in a breast implant lawsuit where they all found out at one time that they were potentially affected by cancer and the franticness of that. And probably thinking where I'm going with this, but as, as you can see, the hat, the blue dog, the cup, the polo. Uh, I live and breathe Tulane as an alumni and as their sideline reporter at this point. And I'll be honest, uh, it's a lot easier now to be able to, I don't feel like I have to advocate for them anymore, but I really think that helped instill that fight in me and really want to advocate for covering these guys and getting the attention they deserve, especially this last season. And I think they have it and sustain that now, but I also felt like people were failing to read in between the lines and see the context of the two and 10 season. And all I saw in front of me was a bunch of fighters who played through every single snap that season no matter what the, the score was like, what the situation was like, what the injuries were. And I think I subconsciously really tapped into that advocacy part of myself when people were asking me after the season, well, why don't you go somewhere where it's more successful? And I almost yelled at people because, again, that advocacy really came out of me. But what I started to realize was, I've mentioned this before, but I, I really will dive into that more emotional part of me because, again, that seemed to resonate on last episode with you guys, how I've really leaned into uh, my emotions, which I joke all the time about crying in football and people that have known me my entire life probably laugh hysterically when they hear, uh, they're listening to this, that 
I'm leaning into my emotions because I'm very much like my dad. He's very pragmatic. And I've just never really been an extremely emotional person. I've always really taken life, rationalized it. And, you know, I obviously don't ignore them. I did shut them in a box for a long time, which kind of led to these hardships all popping out at once. But it's a new venue for me, I guess, in my coverage. But I think, A, there's something to be said about a women's touch. But also going through, quite frankly, mostly trauma related to the workplace that I'm going to delve into that, again, when I'm talking about that advocacy and seeing myself in in this two-lane team, it, it, we're in the argument stage right now of whether or not they should be considered employees or not. But I really, again, identified with that core of the team in a way that I don't think I ever saw coming when I took the job at all. Go. Go. All right, let's get into the weeds really now of, of how exactly I came to be a sideline reporter with really no experience at all and how I learned to channel a lot of things I went through, my work experience that I just kind of talked about, but quite honestly, the interpersonal things that happened to me in, in my workplaces that affected me immensely and is something I'm still really working through in my head today, but really has been something that you know, we had brought up trauma and talking with Ross in the last episode. And I really liked what he said where, you know, it's already happened to you and there might not be something meaningful to derive from it, but you got to get something. Otherwise you're just being beaten. I remember writing this word document after what I had gone through in my first workplace experience, where I remember writing what, is the value of this situation. Because if I can't find it, then I really don't know how to reconcile and move on with it from this because all I feel is pain, hardship, symptoms of what's called complex PTSD. And I'm really just not going to get into the weeds of what that is right now. Uh, and really a self fracture and an identity crisis, including anxiety and depression that were also brought on and very ignored by me from my concussion, something that I would just like to throw out there. If you get a head injury, your doctor is going to tell you that you're at risk for anxiety and depression, and they are correct. And if you ignore them, you will set yourself up to be much worse off in the long run. But I won't get into specifics because it's also something I, I want to keep relatively private, but I, I was manipulated in the workplace by someone that I was very close to and it eventually led to some false things being said for lack of a better term that, you know, I had to fight against and then not really know what I was doing at that job after the fact. I had moved to Philadelphia. I really didn't know anyone. And three weeks into the, living there, I hit my head in a bagel shop. And so I was just really, to say that I was out of it is an understatement. And as I was kind of healing through that, I idiotically decided, why don't I take the GRE now as I'm four months into my recovery, still going through eye therapy? Because again, this trajectory of a timeline, granted, if you want to go get a PhD, it's seven years long. So time is of the essence there, but I just did not do myself any favors. And then I ran into a really bad person and I stayed at that job for way too long after the fact. I remember that I had a migraine for four months straight. I'm sorry, not four months. Four weeks straight. Uh, it was long lasting, but it was every single day. I could not come into work. I had to apply for leave without pay. And right after that, my, my dad had emailed me and said he had found this jury consultant in the area. And the second that I quit that job, all, my migraines just went away. And the, seeing how physically affected I was by that job really stuck out to me. But I didn't take any time to reconcile anything that happened to me. I wrote a paper for my legal studies class and then I hopped into uh, another job and that one again, without giving specifics, more toxic people, more manipulation coming from more of a position of power. And I started to doubt myself. I started to feel incompetent when you're being microanalyzed and micromanaged and criticized for quite literally everything. You start to not trust your own instincts and I was really grateful the day that I never had to step foot in there again, but I had to, again, job hop, hop, job hop to survive and get out of that situation. And so I jumped immediately into another job that 
my first day I was assigned again, this systemic juvenile detention facility abuse case dating back to the seventies at minimum, speaking to hundreds of people that were abused in so many different ways, having to write that document up on the systemic abuse, how it was deliberately covered up by the school, by the nursing staff. It's called Glenn Mills. You can feel free to look it up. It was awful. I don't realize, I think I realized how much I internalized that. That was the healthiest workplace I had been in previous to my current experiences now, but that job just took so much out of me from that advocacy standpoint. So I, I moved down here and I was actually you know, in, in the running for another job and thought that I was going to get farther and was disappointed for a lot of reasons. And quite literally the same day that I got that bad news, I was not in the mood. I, I was just not. I was upset. I It was beaten down year after year and felt like I was finally going to get somewhere. And Todd Graffanini calls me and said, I want you to talk to Corey Glory. He's going to give you a call today. He's the new voice of the Green Wave. And I'm thinking, this is not the time for me to have a job interview right now. Like I, I'm feeling very aggressive. I had just you know, been co-hosting a radio show where I got called out for a few things I normally wouldn't care about, but I was taking everything personally that day. Very much had a chip on my shoulder. Never met Corey. And, and I probably will never give a job interview like that in my life again. You know, I was upfront that I was in a bad place, but I really just think again, when you have nothing to lose and you really just got, come from the heart, that was the only interview that I had for that job. That was enough for Corey to see how much I really cared about this. And then I go into this season and we there's a hurricane evacuation. Everyone's miserable. Then two and 10 happens. Really bad losses like the Ole Miss one, the Tulsa overtime loss where missed a field goal and... The, and then lost in overtime, which was my five-year anniversary homecoming as an alumni. So that was a really tough one for me to reckon with. But I didn't, again, expect to be an emotional sideline reporter. And I have really approached those two seasons very differently based on knowing what these guys were going through. I know it's not the same thing necessarily as a lot of the trauma that I went through, but I think when we get into the business of quantifying hardships and comparing them, I just think everything is relative and everything matters. And what happened to those guys on the field mattered. What happened to them off the field mattered. Being evacuated for 27 days with barely any change of clothes and just to evacuate every person in an athletic department and every team at the same time, the fact that they found somewhere to go is actually incredible. But and then you think about Nick Anderson, whose sister was in a, a car accident and was going into major surgery before the Ole Miss game. A lot of local guys that have family in New Orleans that didn't know if their houses were okay. A lot of guys lost their housing. Now, those are real hardships that those guys went through. And, and so I, I got really defensive a lot of the time when I would be explaining why I still thought that they were a good football team and why I was so loud about that last July when... Again, I had been hearing them since January, thought they were insane, but I was really the only one I, in, in terms of media, not withstanding the broadcast team, but I don't blame them. But the media did not show up really to the spring practice for Tulane last year. But I saw them every day and I saw that how much they wanted it, not chip on their shoulder, really being channeled into something powerful. And so by the time we got to July, I, I was right there with them. And you, know, you guys see me freaking out on the sidelines a lot of the time during games. And I, I cried during the championship game and the Cotton Bowl. But I really think going through trauma and, and learning how to approach each person with empathy and give them the space as well to come to me. Because... And again, I, I didn't want to push relationships on these guys when they're not winning any football games. We're all stuck in a miserable situation. And I didn't really get any time to know them beforehand. And so I was very much kind of my only child silent observer, but always kind of being present and being there and showing up alone matters. And walking in my second year, you know, I, all these guys are saying hi to me, giving me hugs. And it kind of took me aback because I thought, you know, I, I really hadn't made that many connections my first season, but I think what I really did was approach relationships from a trauma-based perspective, a hardship perspective, and 
seeing that vulnerability in the players, allowing them to open up to me when they felt like it, but never trying to push myself onto them. And I don't feel like I would have had that holistic level of understanding without the acute trauma that I had went through in the workplace again, because it was all connected to that for me. And I've had some personal things go wrong, but it also hit me like a train because for the most part, my life was really good for the first 20 something years of my life. It was really until I got in the real world and met a lot of manipulative, bad people that my worldview really changed. So as I was kind of reconciling with that, I going to make the most ridiculous statement ever and, and, and compare myself to Drew Brees. But I remember reading in his uh, autobiography that he came to New Orleans because he saw a city that needed to heal. And in tandem, he saw where he could heal himself. That statement could not apply, I think, more to me and how I feel about allowing the Tulane football team to heal me even before the 12-2 and two season. Go, go. Now that I'm kind of that sentiment of really being able to heal myself through a team and seeing that fight that I think I needed to see someone else show me. I, I made jokes that you know when I'm running now and I want to give up, I think, did Tulane give up in the Cotton Bowl? Did they give up after they won two games the year prior? I know that sounds absurd, but it really has been so personally inspiring and so healing for me in those ways that it's really, I think, allowed me to get so much more out of the sideline reporting role than I would have ever anticipated. And I don't think is ever really awarded the credit it deserves in these kind of situations. It's a two or three way street, I guess here. You know, I, I have to, I can't talk about what I think I've done to redefine what it means to be a sideline reporter without talking about the people that have given me the chance to do so. Corey Glor and Steve Berrios treat me as a third party equal without question. You know, I, they come to me if I have something almost every commercial break. It's very unheard of for sideline reporters. When I took the interview, Corey told me, you know, I want you to have teeth in your reporting. And one of the things I had told him was, I have no experience doing this job, but I, I could talk football until the cows come home. I went to Tulane, it's something I really care about. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I've always been told that I have the gift of gab and it's what led me to go into theater and, I, you know, excel at things like debate in high school. And I have no stage fright. So public speaking has just never been an issue for me. But that really, I think, bridged a lot of the gaps for me in how to provide entertaining analysis. But I'll be honest, if I went back and listened to my first season, sure, it's really, again, it's complete night and day on what you're analyzing there. but. If you're a sideline reporter out there and you're a woman in this industry, have you ever considered taking the Scouting Academy? Please know that my DMs are open at any time to ask me about that and if I can help you. Even recommend just so many books that have really shaped how I see the game. And it's hard for me to say that I would be... Double negatives and all that are really hard, so I'm just going to start over. I, I, I've always known the game of football, but... It's really weird watching it sometimes when you're looking at it kind of right in front of your face, trying to figure out which angle is best and cutting through all that noise to see something that is actually valuable and worth bringing up. And I don't think without the Scouting Academy, the game slowed down for me in the way that players, I think, always explain that in the transition, you know, from college to the NFL, for example, that really slowed it down for me. And, but again, that all comes back to the fact that the broadcast team has given me the space to do so. And the football team, Coach Willie Fritz, all of the staff and the players, they have all given me the ability to, to do what I do. Again, I, I didn't know that you're not supposed to walk through the players bench. Not having that experience, sometimes you just bulldoze through things, but no one's ever said a word to me. The fact that I have been able to sit in on game prep meetings on on special teams, defense, and really just learn as a student of the game because of the access, you know, when talking with Willie Fritz about potentially having an interest in coaching. So of course, all of that is not for the broadcast. And just coaches answering basically any question we always have. There's never been 
oh, this is closed off from the broadcast team. It really feels like we are genuinely a part of the team that we travel with them. We are able to go to every practice. We don't ever have any restrictions. Willie Fritz sits with us once a week in his office for 15, 20 minutes. And, you know, it's off the record, but gives us a lot of context that I don't know if I would have known what to actually be looking for if not for that scouting academy experience. But I also just think I read my contract and it basically said, provide sideline analysis. It in nowhere said you will update on injury and you will update on random stories that don't really have a place in the broadcast. What I would recommend is finding your niche and starting with that. Because again, I know that there are male sideline reporters and this is not to make that, you know, a different thing, but I think there is a crisis of confidence a lot of the time for women, especially because most sideline reporting jobs are fluff. And that's why I could not recommend more seeking out that knowledge, just if nothing else to feel like you can do it. But for example, I'm not going to ever probably be a quarterback expert. So focusing in on that, my first season wouldn't have really made any sense to me, but the secondary, that's really my bread and butter. And I also think with the familiarity of two seasons out under my belt, really knowing those guys in the backfield, I can't say that I really could have differentiated what the different skill sets that were necessary between Larry Brooks, Lummy Young, Macon Clark at Nickelback, Jaden Kennedy, and then Jarius Monroe, Lance Robinson, how all of their roles were different in man coverage, in zone coverage, what different coverages look like with disguises, single high safeties, middle of the field, either open or closed, open if you have two safeties back there in that, you know, cover two or a split safety look, or if you just have the one free safety roaming, what other coverages look like and blitzing things that go into the intricacies of the slot role for Macon Clark. I don't think I would have been able to see how much he was born for that role if I didn't know what I was looking for. But if I had tried to start again with something that just wasn't what I know, and again, I think the secondary for me really comes down to the fact that I was a center back playing soccer and defense. And it, it really, you, know, you could call it being a box safety. You could call it being a coverage linebacker, but that kind of pitch enforcer when I played a diamond defense and even in a flat four, yes, you, you move off one another a lot more, but I never had a boot for a, a kick, but I was very precise. So I was often the one funneling attacks up the field. So yeah, you could, it's easy for me to see myself in those situations and then just chart things, look at things in practice, look and see, you know, even if you don't know what it is, because that's what really led me to get into the scouting Academy in the first place was started to see tendencies. And I talked about this with Deuce Windham a few guest episodes ago, and I could kind of see where things were going wrong, but I didn't exactly know how to explain it other than my instincts were just kind of telling me things. And that's where I you know, leaned into the scouting academy, but lean into what you're knowledgeable with, but also lean into your emotions if you're a sideline reporter, because that's really what it's about at the end of the day. You're right there in the middle of the action. And, you know, at, at best, you're a non, you're, you're invisible. I, I'm sorry. I, I, at worst, you're invisible. At, at best, you're someone that they can look to for a hype moment or get the crowd going and I feel like as unhinged as I can get that it is appreciated by you know the team and the players that I really try my best to get the stadium engaged but you no know, I also each guy is individual and I know that some guys don't want to be approached during the game at all some you know like Tajay he gets really into the game so I just kind of walk by and give him a fist bump I'm not really going to break things down with him but you no know, there are other guys that I'll open up, I guess, a little more in a game setting. It depends on the position that you play, but just really feeling that out and leaning into, again, your emotional side, because it's not a surprise to me that players have told me things that I've still kept to myself in a lot of ways, but the things that I wouldn't have ever really expected them to tell me in my position. And I think that's really the work that I've put in these two seasons of being there and showing up every day, understanding from you know, psychology and working in mental health standpoint, including going through my own trauma, how to really handle a team that's doing really awful on the field that you're just getting to know. And 
really how I channeled that into this season, use my advocacy for my class action work into really promoting this team this year, getting fans to show up to sell out homecoming for uh, against uh, Memphis, which I hope does not have to be a thing this year. But if you feel like you see something, then just write a note on it. Look into it. Ask a coach, ask a player. I, I might be in a unique position where this might be bad advice if your coach is an a-hole, but I also wouldn't recommend taking a job where your boss is an a-hole because trust me, that is so not worth it in the long run. Healthy workplace environments to me are the paramount thing to life, happiness, and success only because it's the one universal thing we're all forced into doing. You know, obviously, you know, people can argue that breakups, divorces, all these things are worse, but it's all relative to what you go through. But unless you're, you know, a millionaire or I don't really know, we all have to work and get something out of it. And maybe you're sitting there today thinking, I hate my job, but I went to school for it. So now I feel like I have to do this. I've spent so much time. It's a sunken cost fallacy. And you know, what, what am I going to do? It's too late. I have no connections in sports, whatever, even if it's not sports, but just honestly do a self-assessment of what you think your strengths and weaknesses are and really take a step back and think if this is a job that I want to do and, and just do that as you as a person, don't do it with a specific job in mind, but then look at those skills, look at those traits and see how you can really use them to embolden and perhaps break into an industry that you don't have the resume or educational background for. Like, again, I really want to emphasize again that I'm not glorifying trauma, but if I was writing down what makes me a good sideline reporter, I think you wouldn't think immediately trauma, but it is. And there was a point in my life where I considered that a weakness. I now consider it a strength. But the reason I say strength and weaknesses is because sometimes weaknesses are relative. And you know, something like advocacy, it was really a fault in my class action work. And I, I really had issues remaining objective. That's something that has turned into probably my primary strength as a sideline reporter. So I think, again, you know, as much as I talk about the scouting academy and learning how to scout traits on what people can and can't do, we're not professional football players. What you might think that you can't do, and that makes me think back again to the AIQ conversation I had about the athletic intelligence quotient assessment, where maybe a player can't do something because they just don't understand spatial processing. Maybe you can't see the forest for the trees because you're surrounded by people that are not good people that you're lacking a leader or that you feel like you need to be a, a leader yourself. Maybe you consider yourself more of a lone wolf. I realized that the nine to five corporate workplace just did not work for me. And again, cannot emphasize my gratefulness to, you know, C Corey for Ed, Ed Steve, where that, it's up to me what I want to say when I want to say it. And I'm pretty much left alone for, how I want to get to the field on Saturday. And it's never been a moment where I feel anything but completely free. And I feel that exact same way here on this podcast, being able to just sit here, talk to you guys, hopefully resonate with you. I don't think I could be having these types of conversations again if I hadn't gone through all that, but also hadn't gone to therapy to learn how to deal with all that. And find a way to channel that into my sports coverage because it's also something I tap into as a writer as well. You know, I, my favorite stories have always been the ones that are really not about the X's and O's. Think that they're essential to the game themselves, but sure, you can learn them. And again, I, I really recommended doing so. But to me, it's all about storytelling in sports and that's really what I've gotten out of this the most. You know, even if it's not something about, oh, I've noticed dime defense going on the field. They're bringing in you know, Corey Flatter, Jesus Machado as a third linebacker and slopping out Lummy Young. I know that set because I paid attention to it in practice kind of thing. It's also looking at body language, looking at what players are talking to each other. I think it's very important when 
I see interplayer coaching and I brought that up before where I've seen players also take responsibility like Dorian Williams in the SMU game where it was some fluke touchdown that really wasn't his fault. And he really shut everyone down from the, the frenzy that they were getting into and was a leader in that moment. I've seen Lance Robinson and Jarius Monroe go over coverage concepts together and people, especially cornerbacks that it's a tough job to lose the rep at because a lot of the time it ends up being a touchdown, seeing how those guys really interact with each other, seeing how Michael Pratt goes and talks to the O-line after all, everything, you know, goes it and talks to every position group that there's so much human element and genuine care for one another going on down there. When I talk about this legacy and culture that Tulane's built and why I feel like I have a unique place in what's going on right now is because I think they are the exception to the rule where these guys are just such throughout and throughout great guys that are brothers first teammates second. And that's something that I feel is as essential to the broadcast to promote as you know, what defensive front are they trotting out on the field? Let's go. Let's go. I go back to something I said in my first episode. I, I repeated this sentiment of any job is what you make it, but it takes the right human beings. And if I had heard that advice up until where I am now, I probably would have gotten annoyed and felt like people just didn't understand me. So I hope again that this look behind the curtain shows that it's really me coming from a place of vulnerability but showing you know how important those notions are because I, I wasted five years of my life ignoring that advice and jumping headfirst into an industry with absolutely no experience was the best thing I could have ever done. But the fact that that's also translated here with you guys on this podcast, and I say any job is what you make it, I'm grateful as much as I am to Tulane to Dave Grubb, my boss, for giving me full creative freedom here and Again, for being a show about football and for someone that has gone to the scouting academy and could really break down things, I think there's a time and place for that. But again, I'm surprising myself with how much I've leaned into my emotions to storytell here. And the overwhelming response to Friday's episode really validated that for me. And not in a sense of, you know, I, I think that I'm awesome and doing something right, but that emotions and stories of who people are in human as human beings matter just as much to this sport as the X's and O's coverage. So I really appreciate you all for giving me this space because it's, this has really been as healing for me as being the sideline reporter has in just a short period of time. So again, if this continues to resonate with you guys, I, I can't again express how much I appreciate the fact that so many of you spent over an hour of your time listening to just an interpersonal conversation of me and someone I hold very dear as a close friend. So just if you could remember to please like and subscribe, even if it's just clicking like, clicking subscribe, downloading an episode. If you want to listen to it later, you can only get through half of it. But it, it, it all helps me on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. And again, I don't care so much about view counts from a perspective of... No, I don't know how to put it. It's more that I care that you guys care about what I'm saying and that this is resonating with you guys and that my vulnerability is hopefully getting through to a few of you. That's really what I care most about with this. And it, it makes me just extremely excited to continue this going into two lane season, going into the Saints season and really having a, a, a true opportunity to show how much life imitates sports. I'm really looking forward to Friday's guest. I say that every week, but I promise you this one's going to be a really unique and good one. And with that, I will see you on Friday. <laughs>